So welcome everyone to our first Lama Klima webinar on the future of land cover, land management and climate change. Uh, this webinar is actually a part of a series of three webinars and we will take about one hour today with two speakers, Quentin Lejeune and Alexander Pop. Um, each of them will give a 15 minute presentation um, and both are part of the Lama Klima project consortium. My name is Inga Menke, I work for Climate Analytics and I will be moderating today. Before we start, I want to give um, you some of the modalities for this webinar. So first of all, we are recording the webinar because we want to share it afterwards on our website. Um, we kindly ask you to rename yourself with your name and your organization or your institute. Um, if you join privately, you can also write private or just write your name, but so that we know who's joining the webinar. Um, you can do this by going to the participants list and then you right click on your name and you can you should see rename in the menu and then you can choose how to name yourself. We would also kindly ask you to keep the video off. We have quite many participants. Uh, we are currently close to 100 and we have more, more than 200 um, signed up. So I would ask you to keep the video off um, so that we have a, a smooth flow of the webinar. If you encounter any technical issues, you can contact Burjo Yesil from Climate Analytics through the Zoom chat. She's one of the co-hosts. Um, due to the time constraints and the large number of participants, um, we will probably not allow for any oral discussion. So that's why um, you are muted. Uh, we have decided to use Slido. Um, and this is where you can ask questions or also post a comment. So how does Slido work? You go to slide.do and you key in the Slido code, which you see now on the slide, which is 010919. Um, and there you can ask any question. So you can open it already. You can open it on your phone or on your computer. And throughout the webinar, whenever you have a, have a question, you can post it there. Everyone else can also see the questions and comments that others have posted there. And they can like um, questions they find interesting. The questions will then automatically resort uh, by the number of people who have liked a certain question. The reason why we do this is so that we can go in, in order of priority um, to make sure that we cover those questions that people are most interested in first. You can also, if you have like a direct question to Quentin or to Alex, you can also mention this in your question. Um, yeah, if you don't get through the full list of questions and comments, because we really want to stick to one hour, we will find another way to address these after the webinar and we'll get back to you um, with answers. Um, yeah, in terms of timeline, we will start with uh, two presentations. Um, first, Alexander Pop will present and then Quentin Lejeune. And then we will take half an hour to tackle all questions. Um, that you may have to either of the speakers. Um, I would yeah, like to start with Alexander Pop um, and give you a short introduction. He is a senior scientist at the Potsdam Institute of Climate Impact Research, or short PIC, and he leads a research group on land use management as well as um, PIC activities on land use modeling. Um, Alex coordinates the development of the global land use model MAGPI and has been involved as a lead author in various IPCC reports. Today, he will share some of his insights, particularly on the IPCC special report on land and climate with us. Okay, Alex, um, I will stop sharing my screen and then you have 15 minutes. Please go ahead. Oh, hello, everyone. It's really a pleasure and great to see that so many people joined here. Um, I just will share my screen with you. Uh, there we go. Let's get it started. So, can someone indicate briefly if you can see my slide, my first slide? Maybe? Yes, we can. Okay, cool. Good. Um, first of all, as I said, thanks for the introduction, Inga, and uh, thanks for all of you joining. I will um, do the first presentation here for the Lama Klima Project webinars and focus a bit on the special report on climate change and land, which has been published last year. And I would like to start with this slide and 
I mean, all of us, I guess, know that land is of utter importance. And one of the reasons is that land, pro land provides us with services, um, very important from the perspective of the land project, especially also for the climate, so to say, is land is providing services in terms of storing carbon, for example, as you see here in the left hand figure. But it also provides, for example, food and feed, feed uh, and food our um, population. I would like to kind of welcome you and to introduce you to two persons here. One is, um, what is going here? Uh, Thomas Maltus. And if we would have him with us here in person, he would state that um, population outstrips food supply at one point in time. And the typical figure that you would show, see here, is that uh, over time, um, the demand for food um, would increase um, the production of food due to exponential population. Therefore, we would run into uh, hunger risks. On the other side, we have Esther Bos. She is, a, she, she, is a, she was an agricultural economist, and she would state that the power of ingenuity would always outmatch that of demand. So her theory is that total population would also incre increase exponentially, but due to induced innovation, for example, like the green revolution in Asia, um, food supply would always come along with the population growth and therefore avoid. And if you look at historical data here from FAO, you can see that in the history, at least from 1960 to 2010, the color indicates different world regions, um, but we only have to look at the global number here. Both categories, crop production, but also women in production increased very strong. And as a consequence, uh, also the world's undernourished people in most of the regions decreased, at least this year. Uh, Alex, can you get a bit closer to your microphone? You're kind of zoning in and out. No better. Good. I have no blank screen. But this all comes at costs, for example. We see that agricultural production has lots of externalities. For example, expansion of agricultural areas leads to a loss of natural land. And it comes along with greenhouse gas emissions, but also to changes in biophysical conditions affecting the local climate, which is very important for the Lama Klima perspective. Nitrogen pollution is an important aspect for groundwater, but also for biodiversity. Um, irrigation, I mean, irrigation for agricultural production is one of the main drivers uh, for, for human-induced water withdrawals, about 70% at the moment, and also the loss of biodiversity. And in turn, this could feed back to the degradation effects of these processes to a decrease again in time of food security. So what we can observe is that this, due to this aspect and uh, to these externalities of one of the major um, contributions of services, the food production, land is very strongly under growing human pressure. And this also has been highlighted in the land report from IPCC. You can see here um, different uh, a figure from the summary for policymakers from the special report. And this gives you the share of land types at the global level. And you can see at the very right hand side, um, these are kind of the natural areas, so to say, that those um, decreased very strongly with about, let's say, 28 percentage, about 30 percentage left in natural systems. And mainly the agricultural systems, irrigated cropland, intensive pasture, but also forestry areas like plantations dominate now our terrestrial land. All right, Alex, it, it seems like you might have your hands on the microphone or something like that. You're still mm. sometimes zoning in and out. No, I don't have. I'm, I'm, I'm crouching deeper and deeper, and I'll shout more and more. Um, okay, um, what we can see also is that also intensification has an impact on the whole system. That means here an indicator also from the land report, uh, nitrogen fertilizer use increased, dramatic, use increased dramatically, and the same holds true also for the irrigation water volume. Here indicates the number in the, with the, with labeled by free. But it's not, it's also, and that's what we talk here about, it's also the emissions coming from land are very important. That means about 23 percentage of the whole anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions come from the AFOLO sector, means agriculture, forestry, and other land use. And if you look at the food sector, which also would kind of include transport and cooling and all these things, um, that means that the consumer level um, would also, would, would be even higher. So about 13 percentage of carbon dioxide comes from the from AFOLU sector and methane, the so-called non-CO2 emissions, methane and nitrous oxide um, also contribute a lot, especially nitrous oxide, almost everything due to fertilization and so comes from agriculture. Um, 
In consequence, um, land sectors not only contribute to climate change, but it also has to suffer a lot. We can observe it today with all the droughts going on, um, but also in the extreme events, but also um, in the future it might be exposed even more. These are the kind of burning amber diagrams, very famous for in, within the circles of IPCC. And you can see here the three major categories of the land report, desertification, land system degradation, food insecurity. And the left-hand side, you can see the temperature decree and the red, more red and more purple it gets, the more severe the impacts would be for the respective uh, indicators. I mean, if you look, for example, at food insecurity, we can see that at the threshold of about four degree, the tropical crop yield decline would be tremendous and the food supply instabilities would already at two degree uh, jump into the purple end. But what is very important for this is that it very de much depends on how the future will look like also in socioeconomic dis uh, conditions. So what, uh, what is very um, important are the new developed socioeconomic pathways, so to say. And just to give you an example of two SSPs, that's the acronym for those. Um, the SSP1 is a very sustainable pathway with high income, low population growth very low inequalities, effective land use regulation, and important high adaptive capacity. Um, in contrast, the SSP3 is a pathway which has opposite trends. That means you have a low adaptive capacity, a low income, and such things. And as an outcome, the uh, food insecurity figure, which I picked uh, in, the mo in, the, in, the, in the first slide, it can show that for an SSP1, which is a sustainable world with a high, high adaptive capacity, even under a free degree target, uh, not a target, world, um, the situation would look much, much better than in the kind of non-adaptive uh, situation as in an SSP3. Um, but land is not only under growing pressure, it's also seen as part of the solution for both aspects, climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation. And you can see here uh, one of the figures we had for the SPM also of the land report. And we can see that we listed here different response options for a mitigation, for adaptation from the land sector. First of all, based on land management, agriculture, forestry, and soils, as you can see. And then also for, so to say, demand parts, um, the value chain management. And what you can see that there are a lot of options, first of all. And secondly, they seem to be beneficial for both mitigation and adaptation. And what is important, what I want to show you now, is that they also seem to come along um, with lots of synergies for other sustainability dimensions like desertification, land degradation, and food security. But some also may cause trade-offs. For example, you can see, with, see here with the red dot that reduced grassland conversion to keep the carbon from the perennial um, grasses in the soils compared to annual crops um, might affect food security because um, it's less efficient in the end for food production to go for pasture than for feedstock, for example, from, from crops. What is very dominantly discussed uh, in the big scenarios, what we can see uh, are these kind of land demanding options that are heavily foreseen and might be needed for uh, the very ambitious mitigation targets, like 1.5 or 2, at least what the scenarios tell us, um, are like the CDR options. One very prominent one is bioenergy and BECS. BEX stands for carbon capture and sequestration. Um, and if you do high level area and high level application of this, it might be very, very good for mitigation, not so good for adaptation, and even worse for food security, as you can see in the red color here, because you have a huge competition for land and therefore huge impacts on food prices. But if you do it at a best practice way, that means maybe not occupying that much land, more small scale solutions and such things, this, the, 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 the trade-offs might uh, feed back into more the synergy world and the situation might look much better. So it's an issue of scale. The same holds true for afforestation and reforestation, uh, one of the most important aspects also for the Lama Klima project. And you, here you can see uh, it might be very beneficial for much more aspects than bioenergy and bags. But it might, worse, it might be even worse due to a lower efficiency for carbon dioxide removal for food security. So also here, it's very important to do a best practice way to, to kind of apply these, um, these options in a sustainable way and uh, with the first perspective on sustainable development and change. But land, but land can't do it all. I mean, if we look at this, this is a figure coming from the 1.5 report. And uh, what you can see here are different pathways for the future from 2000 to 2100.
And what you can see is that uh, the, the fossil emissions have to go down very, very strongly in this kind of transformation pathways to a, towards 1.5 degree, which is indicated by gray over time. On the left-hand side, on the y-axis, you see this, uh, the emissions in CO2, gigaton CO2. And you can see that also the land sector shall and has to contribute a lot, at least what the scenarios say. You can see in brown the emission CO2 from land use, which have to get converted into, uh, into negative also in most of the cases. And BEX, uh, which needs biomass from land to be used in the energy system, uh, can be also very strong, especially in the right, on the right-hand side and in an SP5 scenario, which is very, very resource intensive and technology oriented. In more sustainable pathways, which is, for example, the P1 to at the very left-hand side, um, we need much, more much less contribution from the land side and especially much less um, from biomass and bioenergy. So just to give you an impression of what this high application of bioenergy might mean, this kind of a figure that shows you on the x-axis the exajoule per year that might be needed in 2100, um, plotted against the, million, the, the area needed to produce the biomass to feed uh, the energy systems with bioenergy, a million square kilometers. And you can see also different scenarios um, with high carbon prices in dark red um, are kind of the more ambitious, like uh, targeting towards 1.5 degree. The blue ones are the without policy and green is like uh, lower carbon prices. That means less ambitious uh, climate strategies. And what you can see that it can go up in, at least in the 1.5 scenario, so to say, to about the highest level is 14 million square kilometers. And just to give you an idea what this would mean, you have uh, kind of, I've plotted in different countries here. If you can see the area of China and USA would be somewhere at uh, 9 uh, million square kilometers. And this might give you an idea what kind of additional pressure would come to our land terrestrial system if we would do this. So take care. That's it for the moment. Looking forward to your questions after the presentation from Quentin. And many thanks for your attention. I hope the sound was OK. Thank you, Alex. Um, yeah, feel free to already uh, write your questions on Slido. Um, yeah, I think the, the code was posted again in the chat. Um, and then we are going on to Quentin. Uh, could you unshare your screen, Alex? Um, Quentin is my colleague at Climate Analytics, and he works as a data analyst uh, and stakeholder engagement expert. Um, he also coordinates the Lama Klima project, which he will introduce today um, in his presentation as well. And um, before joining Climate Analytics, Quentin completed a PhD at ETH Zurich, uh, where he focused on the consequences of past and future land cover changes on the regional climate. So go ahead, Quentin. Can you hear me properly? Yes. Okay, perfect, yeah. Hi, everybody, and um, thanks, Inga, for the introduction, and um, very pleased to see so many people. I don't think I've ever talked to of such a large audience. And let me know uh, if you can't hear properly or can't see uh, my presentation properly. I will now share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. So can you see the proper view or? No. Okay. We see the presentation mark. Is that no better? Is that no better? I guess, yeah, for me it's good, Quentin. Okay. And I can see your slide. Okay, thanks. Yes. Um, so I will, based on what Alex has just presented here um, just before, and um, I will formulate actually the title of my talk more in form of a question, because Alex has focused um, on what the IPCC special report on land has actually concluded um, last year. And support, I will focus on what we don't know and especially what we want to address in the context of the Lama Klima project, which stands for Land Management for Climate Mitigation and Adaptation. 
And so, um, especially I want to look at the question at how much can land contribute to climate mitigation adaptation, but also keeping in mind the sustainable development goals. I uh, would like to start with some definitions, um, just to make sure that everybody knows what we're talking about, and especially what our land cover change versus land management change. So let's take the theoretical example of uh, we have a let's say we have a forest at the beginning, and then this forest is removed, and in uh, instead of a forest, we uh, we now have crops, as you can see here. And this would be considered as a land cover change, land cover being the physical material at the surface of the earth. And often in the climate community, but also the yeah, land use community. Um, and when we focus, like a, a typical example of a land cover change of interest would be deforestation. So that's what we would have here. Um, but land management change in comparison would be, for example, if you would still have a forest after the iteration, but um, rather a small forest with smaller trees where you have some um, new wood harvesting practices in place. Um, so within the same land cover, just changes in the way that the land use is managed. So what, that's what we define as land management change here. And you could imagine the same for if starting with a crop, for example, if you have crop abandonment, um, trees start to regrow. And so you would have a change in land cover. Whereas if starting from non-irrigated crops, you start to implement irrigation of your crops, then that's considered as a change in land management. After this short run of definitions, I want to come back to the guiding questions, how much can land contribute, and especially look at how much, can, how much land can contribute to climate mitigation. And I will also um, focus now on this figure that Alex has just presented, following up on it. I don't think I need to, um, to spend a lot of time explaining it. I think Alex has, has done it uh, in, in detail before, but just um, to recall, um, these are four illustrative emission pathways. They're all compatible with a uh, limitation of global warming to 1.5 degrees. They come from the IPCC special report on 1.5 degree of global warming. Um, positive numbers mean anthropogenic emissions. Negative numbers mean actually removals, CO2 so removals from the atmosphere, absorption by land, or what we call negative emissions. Um, in gray, you have fossil fuel industry. In brown, agriculture, forestry, and land use. And in yellow, BEX bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. These two constituting the land sector. And you can really see that depending on future fossil fuel industry emissions, important CO2 removals uh, may be expected from the land sector. You can really see the difference, for example, between P1 and P4. In P1, you have um, decrease, it's steeper decrease in, in um, emissions from fossil fuel industry in gray, which is happening earlier than in P4, meaning that in the future, you need less removals through um, AFOLU or BEX in the future. Both, um, what is true for all of these pathways that limit global warming to 1.5 degrees is that both changes in land cover, for example, afforestation or reforestation, and in land management, for example, wood harvesting are expected to play a crucial role in, in this. And um, that's actually something that governments also um, are counting on, also in their intended reduction, uh, um, emissions reductions. Almost a third of them. Um, as a state should be based on land. And we will now look at the question whether so much carbon can actually be absorbed by land. That's what I want to look at now on this slide and showing first this extract from um, the fifth assessment report at the IPCC. And you show here the results from climate models that tell you what the carbon concentration feedback is. It means for some increase in CO2, so PPM being increase in CO2, how much increase in absorption of carbon you could have. And red means that you have absorption of carbon at the land through photosynthesis. Um, and CO2 increase in the atmosphere. And this is a range on the panel on the right with the absorption of the land being in green here. 
The more CO2 in the atmosphere, the more carbon land is projected to absorb. But for the models where natural cycle processes were better represented, that's the dashed lines, nutrient limitation may strongly, strongly limit this CO2 fertilization effect. So that's one aspect which may favor the uh, absorption of carbon by land in the future. But another one is this regional carbon climate feedback. And um, here you see that the warmer the climate, that's what the color scale tells you, the less CO2 land is projected to absorb in many regions. And that's due to uh, drought in increased um, frequency of extreme events, such as droughts, which uh, prevent um, land from absorbing a lot of carbon. You see the opposite behavior for boreal ecosystem, though, because their warmer uh, temperatures mean that the vegetation can actually absorb more carbon. But the question here is, these two processes that we play against each other, like how do they play out eventually? So that's one uncertainty and key uncertainty. Um, I want to also look at the uh, case of wood harvesting, and that's actually a um, case study conducted in eastern North America, where they looked at tree plots and looking at several forest plots. And on the x-axis, you see the tree age, so the age of a forest, basically, and how much carbon is stored above ground on the left and in the dead material on the right. And what you see is basically that um, the holder stood for us, the more carbon it can store, which means that there is a dilemma for wood harvesting because it can help sequester carbon in wooden products. It can also help as a substitute for fossil fuel emissions. But at the same time, more wood harvesting, according to these um, case studies, would also uh, reduce carbon stocks. There are some uncertainties about that, and I don't want to talk too much about them, but rather um, mention this teaser for the third Lama Klima webinar, which will be on 23rd of June, where I'm sure uh, Yulia Ungratz and Pierre Ebisch will um, tackle these uh, questions. Now I want to look at how much land can contribute to climate adaptation. And here I want to focus on the less well understood potential contribution to adaptation. Looking at what we call albedo. So albedo is the ratio of um, up, um, upwelling surface radi uh, solar radiation above downwelling surface radiation. That means if you have a low albedo, the land surface absorbs a lot of the solar radiation that, you, that it receives. Um, and that's the case for dark surfaces. If you remember, if you wear a um, black t-shirt, you it feels warmer than a white t-shirt. That's the same thing. Trees which are darker from space would absorb more solar radiation than um, brighter vegetation types, such as, for example, crops in that case. And that's contrast between trees and short vegetation types is enhanced when there is snow, just because the trees mask the snow. And the snow is very bright, so it reflects a lot of solar radiation. So trees tend through that effect to warm the local climate. But at the same time, trees and crops have different transpiration rates. And what is transpiration? It's a process that consumes energy to um, transform liquid water into water vapor. So that's energy that is not consumed to warm um, the neighboring atmosphere. That means that in regions, for example, the tropics on top where you have trees with high evapotranspiration rates, conversion from trees to crops would actually lead to a decrease in evapotranspiration, so an increase in what we call sensible heat, so a warming of the, of the near surface atmosphere. Um, in temperate regions, that would be the bottom panel. The transpiration rates between trees and crops are not that different, meaning that it's uncertain whether deforestation actually increases or um, decreases uh, temperature through that process. Or well, there are a lot of uncertainties around that. And then we have surface roughness. Imagine um, wind blowing over a surface. If the surface is really uh, rough, it will create a lot of turbulence. So that's what happened with tall trees. There will be little turbulence, there's uh, less mixing of water and energy, 
in the atmospheric column, so the, um, the energy in so the warm air would stay close to the surface. So all these processes and how they differ between different land cover types are called biogeophysical effects, and through them, through them, changes in land cover could have implications for adaptation, because um, the biophysical geophysical effects that arise through changes in land cover actually modify the local climate. And here we have the results of a study where they looked at how much that actually modify the local climate. And you have four climate models. Um, and here are the results for annual maximum daytime temperature. So the high, highest temperature that is recording in a year. If you have land cover changes for one pathway, SSP1, so which correspond to one type of land cover scenario. Alex has explained before what SSPs are. And SSP2 was another type of land cover trajectories. And actually, if you look at the difference between the two, you see um, for some models, for example, the model on the left, differences locally over the order of one degree for two different, between two different land cover trajectories. One degree, it's about the, uh, on land, the effect of a global warming. So of an increase in CO2 corresponding to a global warming of about 0 0.5 degree. So that's really a lot. Um, so that means that these biogeophysical effects of land cover changes, which are the only processes playing out for these results, um, are actually very important when it comes to adaptation. The thing is that and there are many model differences. You can see that between the four uh, model results here. And these prevent from nailing down the exact potential contribution for adaptation. And what about land management changes? Where um, you can look at these results from this uh, newly released study and look at irrigated areas in blue on the map. And you see that the authors, Yang et al, have seen that um, all of these irrigated areas, you see a locally lower temperature of a few degrees, um, meaning that land management also has implications for, um, for the local climate and local, especially the local temperature, um, especially agricultural practices and especially irrigation. But the same processes could also play a role for forest management practices, such as wood harvest. And here, another teaser for the two following webinars. Now, how much can land contribute to sustainability objectives? I want to recall again this figure that Alex has explained. Uh, we have a list of response options based on land management on the left. And we can see that actually they can contribute to a lot um, to achieving um, a lot of the mitigation and adaptation objectives. Um, on the Paris Agreement, because there are many cells in blue. They can help combating desertification, land degradation. They can help achieve food security. But Alex has also emphasized that under some circumstances, some response options, such as reforestation, forest restoration, afforestation could have, um, could entail trade-offs for food security, right? And that means that land use decisions may be based on an integrated view on all, considering all these aspects of mitigation, adaptation, but also land degradation, considering, for example, the ecological aspects, the biodiversity aspects, but also food security. The thing is that the integration is incomplete um, across these aspects in many research and decision support tools. And that's why I want to talk now about the Lama Clima project, which um, is meant to be um, step towards achieving an integrated view, fully integrated view on these aspects. Two minutes. Okay. And especially um, by, we will have two groups in PIC, um, Alex Pop's group and Cicero in Norway. They use models that are belong to um, a suite of integrated assessment models. So they look at uh, different sectors of the economy connected together. And we also have group, other groups, um, BU Amsterdam, LMU in Munich, BU in Brussels, and ETH Zurich that rather use climate models that describe a lot of our processes that are on this figure here. So and especially these biophysical effects that I've mentioned before. And um, since, for example, these biophysical effects that I mentioned before, the aim is that the climate models help refine these incentives 
and that um, especially climate analytics role would be to enhance the integration between the models that are uh, used by PIC and Cicero and the results of the climate models. And based on that, the models used by PIC and Cicero would also help derive new scenarios for land use, integrating um, the novel aspects um, derived from the research outcomes from the Lama Clima project on um, the refinement of the biophysical effects, but also of the potential contribution of uh, land for carbon mitigation. So I hope that was um, a clear, quick overview. And I just want to finish by mentioning the stakeholder engagement activities under Lama Clima. We have this webinar series where one of the output will also be an online tool to explore the influence of changes in forest cover, irrigation, wood harvesting, and climate. And there will also be a workshop um, to do some scenario development for future land cover and land management. And in order to achieve um, the mitigation, the adaptation objectives of forest movement, but also keeping in mind the sustainable development goals. And that's it. I am looking forward to your questions. And I also want to advertise again the following webinars. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Quentin. Um, once you stop sharing, I would share my screen. Um, and I will actually share the Slido um, screen so that we can all have a look together at the different questions that were asked. And we will take them uh, based on priority. No. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can Great. Yeah. All right, um, then I think the first question is um, a request for a comment um, on the perverse outcome that billions of euros in subsidization of large scale bioenergy through RED create um, and should be potentially revisited. Um, Alex or Quentin, does either of you want to comment on this? Um, first, it's also best to maybe I start and then if Quentin wants to add, then the queue can come in. Good. Good. As well. um, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, the question is in the end, how broad you can uh, do, how broad your perspective is. For climate change mitigation purely, the biomass use for sure is a very efficient one and a, a very efficient way. The question is just, does it harm more than it helps in the end? And this is kind of the big question, how, how holistic have we to be in answering the big questions? And for sure, we should not only look at the climate um, mitigation challenge, but um, we have to be much broader in our perspective. So my personal opinion is um, that this large-scale bioenergy is nothing that would survive a, a real sustainability check. But it's nothing that we can neglect in general. So the question is, there was also a recent paper in Nature Climate Change uh, led by Detlef Fuhren in the end, how can we avoid this large-scale bioenergy deployment? And if we, if, if, the, if, we, if we delay our emission reductions very strongly, also from the fossil sector, and want to stay, remain within the budget of carbon emissions, of greenhouse gas emissions, to be broader on this, then um, we will need, just from a mathematical perspective, some kind of, of carbon dioxide removal at some point of time within the century. And so the call is really, if we want to kind of avoid this potentially harmful large-scale bioenergy deployment, we really have to put, put huge, huge efforts into uh, uh, reducing our emissions as soon as possible and as multi-sectoral as possible. Quentin, anything to add from your side? No, thanks, Alex. I think that's I think you you nailed it. Um, the 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 only way to the best way to avoid that that we need such a deploy a large scale deployment is actually to reduce um, fossil fuel emissions for fossil fuel and industry as early as possible and as massively as possible. And that's illustrated in the uh, in this P1 that's pathways. 
Thank you both. Um, I would then move to the next question. Um, what kind of, like you, you both included um, a slide which was also on best practices. Um, and the question is, what kind of best practices of BECS would ensure synergies? I always thought of BECS as a technology that doesn't really come with co-benefits. And my assumption is the question two further down, same on afforestation, what does best practices mean? Could maybe be included. Yes, um, I mean, Alex, I can maybe take up this question because actually, um, the, what best practices mean is actually written in the summary um, for policymakers of the land report, and I have it under my eyes, so I can just read what it means according to the IPCC. And giving you an example, for example, limiting bioenergy production to marginal lands or abandoned cropland would have neglect negligible effects on biodiversity, food security, and potentially co-benefits for land degradation. However, the benefits for mitigation could also be smaller, which comes back to the previous question. And there was also a question for best practices in the context of afforestation. And here, the example that is given by the IPCC is as follows. Afforestation is used to prevent desertification and to tackle land degradation. Forested land also offers benefits in terms of food supply, especially when forest is established on degraded land, mangroves, and other land that cannot be used for agriculture. For example, food from forests represents a safety net during times of food and income security. That's what the IPCC understands when, it's, when it says best practices. Thank you, Quentin. Alex, anything to add? Yeah, in the end, it's also, I mean, Quentin already nicely alluded to, uh, to the whole thing. Um, I mean, there was a lot of discussion for the SPM, how to build up this figure, and I also would like to refer to exactly the, the next question, where kind of how, how are these measurements uh, conducted in terms of best practice? Um, the question is, in the end, how how do we produce this biomass and how does it in, in, interfere at the lowest level with other, other sustainability goals? I mean, let's take the example for, for let's take afforestation and reforestation, for example, in the link to biodiversity, which is also heavily discussed, especially given the fact that the best work came out almost at the same time a bit earlier, maybe. But uh, for sure, there are this kind of huge land demanding um, mitigation measures are also heavily debated. And let's take the example of where do you place, for example, this bioenergy or afforestation areas? If you put afforestation uh, into, um, into a formerly forestry area, then it might be a good way. And if it's not a plantation, but more based on kind of regrowth of natural vegetation, assisted regrowth, so to say, then it might be really a beneficial effect for biodiversity. But if you would place it, for example, in the worst case, even as a plantation, sucking up the carbon from the atmosphere into a savanna, the, the giraffes might suffer a lot. So it's really kind of a local and, and a very local specific activity, um, also guided, and it's important for the Lama Klima project by, by, by the biophysical conditions. For example, if you put it more in the boreal areas, it might be not a good thing for the albedo. In the tropical areas, it might look different. So you always have to be very multiple angled in terms of your perspective. It's also a question, what kind of biomass do you produce? I kind of um, indicated the issue of plantations versus regrowth of natural vegetation. This also holds true for, um, for bioenergy in the end. If you do it, there was a paper by Tillman et al, I guess, some years ago, um, where they assessed what is the biomass potential, so to say, of yeah, let the nature regrow and then harvest at the, I mean, plants usually grow with a sigmoid curve. And if you harvest them at the highest level of the exponential growth, so to say, then you have a very, very beneficial effect for, for carbon. And if you do it based on natural vegetation, then it might be also good impact on uh, on biodiversity. So you you really need to see how you uh, how you how you do the stuff. And it also depends what kind of feedstock do you use. Do you use kind of dedicated crops like or plants like miscanthus or, um, or eucalyptus trees for biomass production, or do you use, for example, residues? There's a big debate whether how big is the residue potential for bioenergy. And even there are pros and cons, because if you take off the residues from the field, for example, from agricultural fields, 
it might be negatively for the soil carbon because um, the plants can't get transferred in the soil anymore. So it's really a complicated thing. But what I have to, my main message here is that we have to be very local specific and then we have to be very broad in our perspective and for sure it might be complicated to get at the, to this large scale level. And there was a question that I said I would look at this, uh, how were these measurements for the kind of best practice assess? Um, I have to admit this was not model based, this was rather based on expert knowledge and therefore we indicated why this, why are these green boxes, so to say, that there is uh, a debate on potential positive impacts, but it's not quite, uh, not based on a quantitative level. In the best practice scenario, in the best practice, uh, best practice area for afforestation of bioenergy. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, now we're moving to the next question, which I think is um, a large one. I'm not sure if we can give a full answer to that here. Um, how would you begin to adapt a culture towards an SSP1 society? Um, I mean, it's a bit of a difficult question to answer indeed, but maybe I can give a try just to say what is, would be the first step. It's a bit maybe probably a bit... Uh, very hard to say, but um, part of the answer lies in the definition of what SSP1 actually is. Um, if you look at the description of SSP1, it, um, it includes a peak and decline population, high income and reduced inequalities, effective land use regulation, less resource intensive consumption, including, including food produced in low greenhouse gas emission systems and lower food waste, free trade and environmentally friendly technologies and lifestyle. Um, so that's what is included in the IPCC report of, um, on land. And that's um, obviously um, as far as you can go in terms of policy relevance without being policy prescriptive, because that's not the mandate of the IPCC and how we should get to these definition of SSP1 is there, I don't think I'm here to, 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 to give policy prescriptions um, to, um, to become policy prescriptive and different people may have different opinions on how to, how to do that. But I think, yeah, the definition of the SSP1 is, uh, is giving you some answer, uh, some, some clues, for example, if you think about effective land use regulation, Less resource intensive consumption include food produced, food produced in low greenhouse gas emission systems, meaning often um, which are not meat based or not animal based, lower food waste, free trade, environmentally friendly technology and lifestyles, all of things that are compatible with uh, SSP1. Just briefly jumping in on my perspective. First of all, I have to say that the SSP1 is not it can be even more sustainable. So SSP1, if you compare it to the Sustainable Development Goals, I think there's no model that really can uh, achieve the, SD, the uh, Sustainable Development Goals within an SSP1, uh, as it has been described in the SSP framework. So we even have to be more sustainable than SSP1 to kind of target all of these SDGs. That's an important aspect to mention here, I think. Um, my, the, the question was how to begin. I think the most important aspect is education. Um, it has been shown very often that education affects also uh, population levels and um, population for sure is a driver of, um, especially in the, in the global south, is a driver um, for, for many aspects, also in the global north, sure, but um, the number of people matters. Um, and on the other side, I think what we really need to know and to understand and to include in all our actions is the aspect of externalities. We talked about food uh, production and uh, the cost of the externalities for the whole system. Uh, I mean, there are kind of buzzwords like natural capital or things which are getting more and more prominent. Um, all these things have to be in included into our uh, national accounting, so to say, to really see what our footprints are. So, um, and then we can kind of, based on this, we can develop the policies to uh, and, and apply the policies, like for example, uh, a global carbon market, um, greenhouse gas market credits and such things, only if you know and include those into your account. 
Thanks, Alex. Um, I think we will uh, leave the, this topic for now and move on um, to a question, I think, to Quentin. Do land-based mitigation strategies sufficiently take into account the potential regional impacts of changing land cover, so rain patterns and temperature extremes? Based mitigation strategies sufficiently take into account the potential regional impact of changing land cover. So I guess in the potential regional impact here is referring to the biogeophysical effects that I've been describing in my presentation: rain pattern, temperature extreme. Um, the quick answer is no. Um, so land-based mitigation strategies. Global scale land based mitigation strategies, such as illustrated in the pathways that uh, both Alex and I have shown, don't take into account these biophysical effects. Um, they, these are absent from the integrated assessment models that derive these pathways. So that's a quick, um, that's, that's, that's an answer that is easy to make, and that's actually one of the goal of the Lamar Clima project to. Um, to close the loop between integrated assessment models that don't take these effects into account yet, and climate models that actually can represent these better and better. And also help climate models help by observations on these aspects that also um, become more and more important and help us refine model findings. Thank you. Anything to add, Alex? All good. All right. Um, thank you. Then we move on to the next question. Um, do you think there is a conflict between large scale land management and biodiversity protection? So maybe I jump in here first because you took over the last question and you can jump in afterwards. Um, thanks for the question. I think it's really, really an important one. And it also refers to the response I gave before, at least I tried to, um, to highlight it that way, that you just can't only look at uh, carbon management uh, or greenhouse gas management or albedo management or whatever um, for the climate without uh, looking at other sustainability aspects and biodiversity for sure. Um, not only protection, but also regeneration of biodiversity, because I mean, we lost a lot and we have to see how can, how may we be able to get it back. Um, and there might be a conflict. The question is how we, uh, how we implement those climate based land management or climate focused land management. And it definitely should not be only climate land management. As I indicated with the giraffes, giraffes in the savannah, all, all local actions uh, might affect um, the biodiversity. And it's not only about, and that's very important, about land is change and carbon losses. Um, if you look at uh, biodiversity, maybe even a bigger driver is the intensification of land uses, especially in agriculture. That means nitrogen pollution, uh, water withdrawals, also freshwater systems, algae blooming in the marine area, um, uh, acidification. All this is also very much and heavily affected by land management, by agricultural management mainly. So it's very important not only to look at the, to the expansion and extensification of agricultural um, production, but also and even more, I would say, to the aspect of intensification. And I mean, this, uh, this means if you want to have lots of biomass for bioenergy production, those also might need lots of nitrogen input, and this also will then affect the intensification impacts. Or you have less land available for food production and may need more intensification, again affecting biodiversity. Thanks, Alex. Um, I would say we move on to the next question. Um, as to food security, what variables or data were taken into account concerning the negative effects of saving grassland and peatland? Yes, that's a question I should answer, but I can't in detail because I was not responsible for doing this for the land report. Um, it's more gut feeling, so not really <laughs> knowledge based. Um, I mean, what I know is that, for example, I mean, peatland protection 
I guess, will not affect uh, the food security so much. I mean, it's not so much of an area, uh, at least in the most producing areas, not so much. And there could be a shifting to other, uh, other areas which are less soil carbon dense, so to say. Um, for, for, the, for the grasslands, um, I mean, what I said, I mean, my understanding of this thing is that there's a much higher carbon density in the grasslands below because these are perennial plants and therefore they store much more carbon in the soils. And um, if you kind of displace these areas with annual crops, you have a loss of carbon from the soils. And if we tend towards more intensified and even more demand for agriculture, for, for livestock commodities, and more intensified means that they get kind of fed by more crops and not so much by, uh, by, um, by, by grass and um, like roughage, um, then this would mean to, we would see such a shift and therefore the emissions. And that would also mean if you could kind of would restrict these grasslands, then uh, they make up a lot of area and a lot of expansion may have to happen into the pasture land, what our models say, um, then we, you would have much more competition for land and thereby increasing the prices. Thanks, Alex. Anything to add, Kumran? No, nothing to add, actually. I just want to mention that quickly that uh, we have another IPCC author from the Land report in the chat who has just posted that. So, Nathalie de Noblet. Hi, Nathalie. And she's just uh, posted something which confirmed, just confirms what Alex has just said that risks for food security in the case of reduced grassland conversion to cropland, where essentially um, that less land, there would be less land available to produce food if, you, if we reduce grassland conversion to cropland. And same for peaklands. Thanks. Um, I think then we are moving on to the next question. How do you see the power distribution among science regarding IAMs, integrated assessment models? Um, only few institutions run them, but they simplify a lot, yet policy demands for advice. Maybe that's not an answer I should, uh, the question I should answer. <laughs> But um, I have to admit, I don't understand it in full either, or there seem to be several questions in there. Um, first of all, um, or I try to give some answers maybe, um, power distribution among science regarding YAMS, only a few institutions. Um, YAMS stands for integrated assessment models. So these are the big models trying to do these scenarios into the future for different sectors, including energy transport, but also land. Um, for sure, I mean, this needs lots of work. Uh, I think in our institute at PIC, there are yeah, many people involved, 15 people, 16 people, so to say, to do so. That's a lot of, because uh, we need to, do, to need to do it all uh, consistent. There are a few around the world, uh, in different continents, and Japan, Netherlands, and so on, uh, states, Germany, Austria. But um, sure, I mean, it's a bit of a condensation. What we try to do is uh, to do, to do all those models in open source. They are open source, so that means they're transparent. Uh, we try to support as many people as possible or institutes all over the world. We cooperate with people from India, from Brazil, from China to kind of le learn and teach them once a year. We have kind of uh, teaching days uh, to use the model really to kind of transfer the knowledge, how to do it. Uh, first of all, to increase the understanding what the models do, but also in terms of um, to handle them uh, together with us. So I think that's the best thing we can do. Um, and for sure, I mean, they kind of don't have the portfolio of options for land management was low in the beginning, but we try to improve more and more. I mean, it was kind of the non-CO2 emissions, land conversion, bioenergy, afforestation, avoiding deforestation. Um, and we extended more and more demand side. And now we kind of uh, implemented uh, wetlands and peatlands and pastures, also dynamic and master production systems. It's, that's a scientific process. We started with a lower number of portfolio of, of options, and now we increase the portfolio to increase the understanding. And for sure, science is dynamic, and therefore the picture also changes. But I hope I put a bit of clarification here, but it would be nice if someone else, like Quentin, also could give his perspective. Quentin? I'm sorry, I didn't get the, the, the last sentence. I think Alex is a better place than me to answer um, to answer this since he's 
to the MT, so I think I will I will stick to his opinion. But I'm, I'm not completely sure I understand fully the question either. Um, so this is maybe something we can follow up offline. Follow up on offline. All right, thanks a lot. Um, I would say we take one last question, um, and then we are wrapping up um, the webinar. So last question: What role does soil organic carbon? compared to carbon stored above land and land cover play regarding climate change mitigation and adaptation. Um, maybe I can take a better question. So I guess it's referring to climate change mitigation in that case, because if we're looking at the carbon uh, that is stored in the soil, um, and so we, we were interested in, in the carbon fluxes, so in how much carbon is stored in the, in the land and especially how much can be removed from the atmosphere to be stored um, long term in the land. Um, soil organic carbon and soil carbon in general is, is not as well known as the above ground biomass. There are higher uncertainties on how high these stocks are. Um, and there have been some studies, for example, where we are looking at what where the effects of uh, land cover, change in land cover uh, and land management since the beginning of anthropogenic activities. And yeah, acknowledging that they were not really looking explicitly at the soil carbon. So that this, I'm thinking especially at this uh, study by in Nature by uh, Herb et al. 2018, and that including soil carbon would probably increase um, the effect of historical land cover changes in, uh, changes in land management, meaning that probably so land, changing land cover and land management and especially deforestation also reduces the amount of soil organic carbon although that can be also context specific alex mentioned the effect of on the that grassland for example store a lot of carbon in temperate ecosystems for example but including soil carbon um, would probably increase this difference that's what they acknowledge in this herbital study in 2018 nature um, so that deforestation basically uh, reduces the amount of soil organic carbon. That's something to take into account. And there are large uncertainty in this component. That's also what the, this paper was analyzing. But the effect is generally, generally estimated to be small in comparison to biomass change. Meaning so that um, the change in soil, in soil carbon due to Historical changes in land cover and management have been small compared to changes in carbon in the biomass. And we can, ex we can expect probably in the future where we would um, conduct a lot of afforestation or reforestation to sequester carbon, that most of the, of the uh, carbon sequestration would occur in above ground or biomass rather than in the soil. I hope that answers the question. Alex, feel free to complement if you want. Now, given the time, um, I'll, 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 I'll stop you. Okay. Um, yeah, I think we should wrap up considering the time. There are still some further questions. Um, we will find a way to answer those um, yeah, in, in some other way. Um, I want to thank everyone for uh, your participation and your active comments. I realize there's also comments on Zoom. Sorry for not following up on those. Um, if you want to read more about the Lama Klima project, um, here is the link to the climate analytics um, page which describes the project. You can also, if you want to tweet about the webinars or um, if you're interested in what will further happen with the project, um, use the hashtag Lama Klima for Twitter. And if you are interested in the upcoming two webinars, which um, Quentin also touched upon, you can sign up through the same form if you haven't done so yet. So thank you everyone for participating. Um, and yeah, if you have any further questions, you can also follow up via email. And thanks of course to the two speakers. All right, um, yeah, have a nice afternoon or evening or morning, depending on where you are. And I hope to see you in the next webinar.